This is our 2021 Community Air Quality Grant Solicitation Webinar. And my name is Christian Dampier. I'm an Associate Air Quality Engineer with the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District. Great. Again, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, this webinar is to discuss the details of our 2021 Community Air Quality Grant Solicitation. We do ask that you please mute your, your audio during the presentation. Uh, no need to have video on as well. Uh, questions can be asked in the chat. We ask that you, at, you chat to the entire group as opposed to just me because I'll, I'm too busy presenting. Um, we have a lot of other great staff on the call who can answer your questions in real time or hold off on your questions until the end. Also let you know that there's a lot more details available in both the solicitation manual and the various program guidelines. And as much as we'd love to see everybody in person, uh, please stay safe at home or if you're at work and enjoy this webinar. Again, this, this presentation will be recorded. That includes all the questions and answers. Uh, the video recording will be posted to our YouTube account as soon as we can get that up there. Uh, we'll send out an email update to the same list that we did last time. Uh, if you do contribute video or audio content to this recording, you are consenting it to having it posted on our website. If you don't consent, please don't contribute or disconnect and watch the video later. Uh, to also begin, uh, just let everyone know, uh, for this solicitation, there is no funding available to replace trucks that are currently in violation of the ARB truck and bus regulation. Additionally, there is no funding to purchase new diesel trucks for any options. If you do have a compliant truck, um, there are options to replace the vehicles with natural gas or zero emission, but there are no funding opportunities to replace a diesel truck with another diesel truck. And just in general, for all of our projects, there, the the applicants must be in compliance with ARB and all local air quality regulations. Community air protection incentives. So the legislature passed AB 617, which changed a lot of the landscape for how we regulate and view air pollution in California. The bill directed the Air Resources Board and the SAC Metro Air District to identify communities impacted by air pollution. In complement to the regulatory actions, the legislature set aside funds to target projects that directly benefit those areas. These funds must be spent according to the priorities identified by the community and the various guidelines that are applicable in a cooperative manner. This is currently our third year of this program, and we have a little bit over $6 million available for projects in the SAC Air District and the Yolo Solano Air Quality Management District. So for CAP projects, uh, we use two different types of guidelines. The first guidelines are the Carl Moyer program guidelines in which we can do on-road heavy duty vehicle replacements, off-road equipment replacement, locomotive repowers, and low carbon fueling infrastructure. Additionally, we can use the community air protection incentive project guidelines, which do allow for projects that reduce air pollution in schools and various stationary source projects. So for this funding program, we've identified several priorities with the community. The first priority identified was cars and light duty vehicles. The best way we can support those using the current guidelines is to support publicly accessible EVSE, electric vehicle charging stations and hydrogen stations. For the heavy duty truck priority, the best way we've identified is to replace existing diesel trucks with zero or near zero emission trucks. In addition, we also are looking to support publicly accessible renewable natural gas and hydrogen stations. For the community priority of school and transit buses, we are looking to replace school buses with zero emission buses and transit vehicles with zero emission community shuttles. In addition, we can also do other projects that have community benefit. So for a community air protection application, um, we're using the same application for all of our programs, but if we do find a project that's either been identified as a potential CAP project by the applicant, or we determine that it could be 
a, a community air protection project, we'll work with those applicants um, directly to, to take care of the requirements. One of the other specifics for CAP is that it does need to show community support. Um, the state is very flexible on how we do that. Um, we can get a letter of support from the community. We can get documentation that's the that there's support for the project from other sources or if the applicant is a community-based organization. So now I'll talk about the Carl Moyer program. So the Carl Moyer program is one of the core programs for the SAC Metro Air District. Uh, we do run this in partnership with both the Air Resources Board and the Yolo Solano Air Quality Management District. Funding is available during the solicitation for all projects in the guidelines subject to the local restrictions, which we'll describe, and that it does include heavy duty vehicle and equipment replacements and low carbon fueling infrastructure. Applications are going to be evaluated according to the Moyer guidelines, the 2017 version, and that does include the cost effectiveness, project life, and funding caps. And we definitely encourage you to review the guidelines because those categories do change quite dramatically depending on what you're applying for. For this round, we have approximately about a little over $4 million available for Moyer projects. Uh, so these are some of the local restrictions that we have. Um, there are quite a bit, uh, but um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you have to be located in Sac County or Yolo Solano. Uh, the one caveat to that is if you are applying for agricultural funding, then it must be a Sacramento County-based project. Because of uh, COVID, we are now doing all of our inspections virtually. Um, that does mean that you need to have access to video and live streaming capabilities. Uh, dear. We are not doing light duty vehicles, lawn and garden re equipment replacement, and uh, applicants are required to deliver the old equipment to barn and auctions. Um, so there's, those are the restrictions we have. Um, they're posted on the website as well, so you can take a look at them. Now talk about our Proposition 1B program. We are using some residual funding that we have left over from the various rounds of the Proposition 1B program. Right now we have about $4 million that's available for new projects. And those are projects that benefit Sacramento. The program still uses the 2015 ARB guidelines for the Proposition 1B program, but it does include any of the updates that have been released. So right now we're looking at funding is available for heavy duty diesel trucks, and that includes just basically CNG zero emission only. Um, there is funding for hybrids. Um, I did see that come across in the chat. Uh, so that there could be some options for a diesel hybrid uh, under the Prop 1B guidelines. Um, so if you're interested, contact us, we can get you more information. Funding is also available for locomotives and rail yards and also transportation refrigeration units, TRUs. So under the heavy duty diesel truck category, um, the primary focus is to replace older diesel trucks with CNG and zero emission. Again, hybrids are an option. Um, the old truck must currently have a filter and have an engine model year as shown. It's a little complicated, but if you have a class five or six truck, it has to have a 1998 to 2009 engine. If you have a class seven or eight, it must have an 05 to 09 engine with a filter. And there are other eligibility requirements that are applicable. Uh, the good news is that we can pay up to $100,000 for near zero natural gas and up to $200,000 for a zero emission truck. So for the locomotive and rail yard category, we are gonna be accepting applications for all projects in the guidelines. Um, that there's many projects in those categories, so we encourage you to look at the guidelines. But we're looking for projects that benefit the Sacramento region. One of the popular options in the past has been repowering older locomotives with clean tier four engines. The funding is based on the historic operation of the equipment and the cost of the repower or replacement. Um, but in most cases, we can pay up to 75% of the cost if it meets the minimum requirements but this is open to all freight railroads, but it does not help passenger railroads. 
So for the TRU category, uh, we do have funding for both zero emission units and the infrastructure for those units. Uh, it's going to be used to, to, to support deployment of clean freight in California. We're hoping to use this to help clean up the distribution centers and warehouses at the existing ones or a lot of the new ones being built here in Sacramento. The funding is variable. It's based on the, the technology as outlined in the guidelines. It's a little complicated to talk about in the presentation, but read the guidelines if you're interested and then contact us if you have any questions. Um, one key thing is the application can be for the unit itself, the infrastructure itself, or you can do it both. So if you just want to put chargers at your distribution center, that's an eligible. If you're a fleet that wants to do cryogenic or something, that's an option as well. So one unique overlap with the 1B program is we can use some of our community air protection funds to fund truck replacements under 1B. If you are a truck fleet and you do apply for Prop 1B funding, we may evaluate your project under the community air protection incentives um, to see if it's a match. Um, and that's really just to check if you are in a DAC, uh, disadvantaged community. So definitely encourage you to take a look at that link before you apply. It does, you can enter your address and it will tell you if you're in a DAC or um, any other identified zones in the state. Next is the farmer program. So the farmer program has been very successful in Sacramento. Um, we've been doing it for several years and one of the things that we're doing this year is focusing on the most successful part of the program, which is the electric utility vehicle replacement option. That's based on strong demand. We had a lot of demand for this technology in Sacramento, and we're also now working with Feather River at QMD to expand it to Sutter and Yuba counties. It's also a great way to promote zero emission technology in the ag sector, um, and it's a very simple program that's accessible to farms of all sizes. Um, there's no restrictions on who can apply, so it's great for urban farmers or large scale farmers. It's, it's open to everybody. If you do have farm tractors, you know, diesel tractors that you are interested in replacing, we can do those under the Carl Moyer program, and there's really no benefit to doing them under the farmer, um, so that's why we choose to use Carl Moyer. So the funding details uh, for this program, uh, we are using the farmer guidelines, and that is we can provide 75% funding of the new UTV up to $13,500 per vehicle. You must have a business address in Sacramento, Sutter, Yuba County. Um, does not matter where it's operated or if you own land, it has to be where we do the tax and payment information. <clears throat> You must have two years of ownership and usage documentation. Uh, we are very flexible on that because it is a very new pro program and the records are, are all over the place. Uh, Patrick Robinson is our uh, key go-to guy for the farmer program. And if you have questions about that, get in touch with him. He's been working on these projects for a while and can let you know kind of what's, what's expected. And one key thing to remember, the old vehicle must be scrapped um, and if it is registered with the DMV, then we do need to worry about the title and we need to make sure it's clear and then we will have everything uh, submitted to bar none for those. And finally, I get to talk about the CCAT program, a program that I've been working on for a very long time. Uh, we are going to reopen the CCAT program using leftover funding and we're using nearly identical guidelines to the last time that we opened CCAT. We have about $4 million that's currently available, and that's going to be open to all of the SACOG counties, which is El Dorado, Placer, Sacramento, Sutter, Yolo, and Yuba counties. We are restricting it only to zero emission truck purchase, and that is purchase without scrap. So it's just adding additional zero emission trucks to your fleet, and we can pay $100,000 per vehicle. One key di difference this time is the projects are no longer first come first served. Everyone needs to apply during the solicitation period and then we'll review and rank the projects, even the CCAT projects, according to the guidelines. And then people will 
will get their approvals later this year. One of the nice things is that we are able to stack uh, CCAT with HVIP. All of our other programs, no, you can no longer use HVIP in conjunction with our funding. Um, so even though the $100,000 CCAT award seems a little low, it can be matched with all of the other programs out there, which can dramatically buy down the cost of the equipment. We do need to make sure that the combination of the funds does not exceed the cost of the vehicle. And also remember that these are independent programs. HVIP is run by a different group than us. So your approval under one does not guarantee approval under the other. Nevertheless, it is a good option for refuse trucks. Um, we're working to try and deploy a bunch of zero emission refuse trucks in Sacramento. It seems to be at the up and coming category. Um, so if you're a public or private agency, we'd love to work with you. Transit shuttles are also a pretty good option. You know, COVID has changed the landscape of transit in the world. Um, so maybe there might be an opportunity for more community-based shuttles and neighborhood transit options, which are good for zero emission. And also some school bus projects. Um, we have school bus funding for Sacramento, Yolo, Solano counties, but the other SACOG counties, we don't have the school bus funding for, but you can still apply for electric school buses under CCAP if you live in those counties. For more information about HVIP, um, we have the web link to the website there. So now I'm gonna go ahead and turn the presentation over to Mike Neuenberg, who's going to let you guys know about what's going on for the project funding and the application periods. Christian, yes. can you clarify for the lawn and garden equipment? Uh, we have someone from Sacramento County that would very much like to be able to apply as it's a high rate of emissions for their community. I know that um, only for schools is it covered, but I do believe there's a caveat just in case there's a shared use or a communal thing. Would you be open to explaining that? Yeah. Um, sorry, I am mute. Or yeah. Um, under the community air protection incentives, we found there is a, an opportunity that if you are a private contractor or even another government agency that is not a school district, but you do uh, lawn and garden servicing of schools, um, you are eligible under the uh, clean school funding to apply for zero emission lawn and garden equipment. Um, so if, if you are covered under that category, uh, contact us uh, so that we can just verify some things and see what we can do for an application. All right, thanks Christian for uh, starting us off and kicking us off here on that. Um, and I saw one other question on the chat room about lawn and garden equipment just in general. Um, and just so you know, we as an agency have recognized that that is a chapter the in the Moyer guidelines, the lawn and garden chapter has probably not been updated for probably, I would say 10 to 15 years. It's been quite a while. That is one of the things that we're gonna work with the Air Resources Board uh, on later this year. Currently, we're actually working with the Air Resources Board on trying to update the guidelines even for the on-road chapter because we've recognized uh, that's the priority, at least from the ARB and the Air Districts uh, stand viewpoint uh, that that's a chapter that needs some uh, significant updating right now at this point. It's been a few years since it was last updated and with all the current advanced technologies on the on-road segment, that was where we need to focus resources first. But there are significant things that we've seen occur in the lawn and garden category in the last couple of years as well, uh, such as zero emission blowers and uh, weed eaters and all kinds of other things, including even uh, riding lawnmowers, which are now available as zero emission equipment as well. So uh, probably more to come on that front. Uh, the cap and trade uh, dollars do handle the school segment. So as Christian said, you know, if you're uh, somebody who's involved with the schools and doing lawn and garden efforts there, uh, we definitely have uh, funding opportunities for you there. And uh, we certainly would entertain uh, applications along that front. And uh, that's a category that uh, I think is going to probably see some changes here, or at least we're going to encourage changes uh, from our Air District perspective as well. So with that, uh, let's move on to project funding. Okay, uh, I'll kind of cover more of the general perspectives. Christian's done a nice job of obviously covering the different funding streams that we have. Uh, one of the things I saw a lot of questions uh, coming on the chat room, and, obviously, and at this point I'm probably going to have to sign out of uh, not paying too much attention on the chat room. Uh, we'll 
you know, hopefully somebody can, Gina can fill me in if I need to uh, along the way on that piece. Uh, one of the things I want to at least just clarify with everybody, uh, we have a general application process. Um, for the most part, you're not going to have to worry as much about the specific funding source for your category. Uh, we're going to cover the general, as Christian has already covered, we've got, you know, basically if it's an on-road equipment or off-road equipment or if it's infrastructure, uh, and I should say on-road and off-road on the heavy duty side or medium heavy duty side, we're going to have funding available for you, or at least we're, we'll, we'll help, our staff is going to work with you in terms of the, uh, identifying that best funding source. Um, you know, so the staff, when we receive the applications, we'll find out what you're actually intending to do from a project in. Uh, we've been trained and we know that there are a lot of different programs right now and uh, a lot of different uh, funding opportunities. And it is confusing. Uh, there, you know, all these different funding streams have different guidelines that are attached to it. And so we are trying to make this a little bit more efficient and streamlined uh, from a community perspective and from a dealer perspective to try and uh, make it as clean as possible. With that said, obviously some of the guidelines were shared, uh, obviously many of the guidelines were shared by Christian here earlier on. So if you do have some things that are specific to say a project in El Dorado or Placer County, most likely, you know, what we're looking at there is that would be a CCAT funded program and beyond road trucks. Uh, our own Sacramento County has pretty much all the funding streams available. And, uh, you know, so we'll help you identify depending upon where the project is located and where it's operating. Uh, and then we're going to have a table here on the next slide that just kind of shows uh, some sample award amounts. So uh, I won't spend a lot of time on the slide, but it is available on our website. Um, and it is also available uh, within our uh, solicitation manual as well. Basically, what we have here is a, a grid that shows the five different major funding streams that we have here. And you'll see the categories on the left hand side as well. So from anything from like farm tractors, for example, that's going to be a Moyer program only that we have right now. And I will say for farm tractors, it'll show more specifically on a website. That's going to be a Sacramento County element only. So if it's a yellow county uh, or some other county, uh, that would be something they would look at for maybe your own local air, to that local air district to do. Uh, heavy duty truck replacements, you can see that CCAT and Prop 1B manage that. Locomotives, uh, we've got community uh, air protection uh, Moyer program in the Prop 1B and you know, so on going down there as well. So as you can see that we have, if you notice there, there's not a category there that qualifies under all five. So it is something that there's maybe two or three categories that go there and you could use this chart perhaps to kind of help guide you through the application process uh, when you're applying to us. Uh, one other thing I will also mention is that uh, while we're running a solicitation here, our staff is readily available. We're listed on the website. So if you have any questions on the application, please feel free to reach out to us um, via email. Uh, is probably gonna be the cleanest way to do it. We do have, I think, some phone numbers listed as well. And we will return uh, messages as well. Most likely it would start off with the phone message system because we are working remotely, but we, are, uh, we will return your calls promptly from that end as well. Okay, now we'll talk a little bit about the application process. Um, I probably touched a little bit of this on the funding slide, but yes, uh, we are working remotely, and I think that's going to be the case for quite some time here, at least for certainly the next uh, several months. Uh, so uh, because we are working remotely, the online applications uh, is really the most efficient way right now for you to get information to us and get registered on the system. Um, also, just from a date received standpoint, I'll cover later on on some of the criteria. First come, first serve is one of the criteria selection. And when you turn in your line application and online, it counts as that date received versus when you turn in something through paper, it doesn't actually count until it's received in the mail on our end of the office. So even though you may have filled it out three or four days earlier, you kind of lose out from a, a ranking standpoint from that end. So we certainly encourage you to go with the online application if you're able to do that. Uh, it is for all programs. And, uh, you know, as you might expect on any application, we're going to expect you to provide information about your business, uh, the equipment you want to replace, and the new equipment you intend to purchase. Um, and then we also have a spot there on the application process to talk to add in supplemental documents. So like our payee data form, uh, perhaps your driver's license and some other information would be things we need there. I, I'm going to also stress one thing here as well. What it's important during the application process to make sure you have your legal company name actually listed on that application. Uh, 
Recently in the last year, we've had actually a couple of situations in which uh, the company name did not match with the agreement between like, for example, our payee data form. And so that can hold up payment at the end if for some reason we don't have the right name in there. So when we're thinking about this, whether you're a sole pr proprietor or whether you're doing a do DBA as a doing business as, it's important to make sure that we have the right legal name uh, when we actually do the contract. So that way we can properly pay you at the end of the process uh, from that end. So those are just things to kind of keep in mind. Uh, we will take uh, development or applications are accepted, you know, maybe things that maybe are outside of the box. If for some reason we can't fund it, we can certainly determine if it's a good project. And if it is, then that might be something we can work with uh, either with the Air Resources Board or maybe other funding agencies and see if uh, other funding opportunities might exist. Uh, whether or not it happens right now, that's a good question, but obviously there's no way of knowing what we can entertain within the program guidelines without at least uh, hearing from you from that standpoint there. Okay. Um, and I kind of covered this a little bit with the development applications um, that are still under development with pending partners, locations, and or technologies. Um, as you know, some of these uh, developmental applications, they, they're involving advanced technology. And so, especially if you're dealing with infrastructure, they can take uh, a lot of planning. Uh, we are willing to work with you in partnership with them. We've done a number of infrastructure sites here as we speak. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that are coming on. Do you have the right uh, amount of power, for example, on electricity? Do you have the right size transformer? Do you have the right permits? How much groundwork is gonna be needed? What size conduit do you need? What type of chargers are you using? And depending upon the size, a smaller charger may not need as much planning. If you got a large planner and you're going with high voltage, uh, you know, that could require a significant amount of time and planning in there. So we are willing to work with you, but uh, just be aware that, you know, it's just not an automatic, uh, we can take care of it, you know, within a one day time. Um, you know, some of the things we might look at from a development standpoint would be uh, if you're trying to do mobility hubs, uh, and maybe you don't have a location or a community, for example, of where you know where you want to put it, um, we, can, we can work with you on that and we can certainly work with city and county officials from a planning standpoint uh, to perhaps help identify, you know, good sites. And a good site might not be the site you're thinking of. You know, if you have a site that doesn't really have much for power or, or the ability to house a lot of vehicles, but maybe across the street or maybe just down a block, there's a better setting for actually putting that site or siting it there. Those are the kinds of things that we certainly can uh, assist and work with you on in terms of uh, helping out from there. So just as more of the general application time frame, our application period did start on March 29th, uh, and we're going to run basically through the end of May, right prior to Memorial Day weekend on May 28th. Uh, I do love this next bullet where we'll take applications up to 11.59 p.m. at that stroke of midnight, uh, May 29th, uh, we would close off applications and, uh, you know, that would just be the way it works. Um, as I touched on before, mailing an application means you lose a few days in terms of that uh, criteria from a first come first serve standpoint. We will accept it by mail if that's just, you know, your preference or the way you want to do it. Um, but we are encouraging obviously through the, for the online part. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the next part of it is, you know, we're committed to trying to do the reviewing, we are committed to reviewing these applications as, uh, as quickly as possible, uh, you know, we, we do have a certain amount of, a limited amount of staff resources, but we're definitely gonna, you know, review these things uh, as best we can. Uh, and just so you know, the applications that we've received already, we are starting to review those applications to make sure that they're complete and they have all the documents that are needed there. Uh, so we're gonna try and use that. We are gonna, as this application period closes, we're gonna go into a ranking process. Uh, and your application will rank better if you have all your documents in and submitted on a timely basis. Uh, you know, applications that are incomplete can hold up this process and the actual review part. Uh, and they may also potentially be uh, uh, pulled if we don't have that information as well. So we do need to make sure that we have a, a full and complete application when they come in. Uh, we're anticipating that by the August, September timeframe, we can start awarding out contracts and moving forward with at least notifying you if uh, your application is approved uh, for funding. And of course, uh, projects that are on the larger side, basically the criteria is if it's a million dollars or more, uh, 
our, we would need to take that, those applications uh, to our board for approval prior to executing a contract. As you kind of might guess with any kind of solicitation, even though we have a large pot of money with 18 million available, uh, and we may potentially have more funding available coming in in the next couple of months, just so you know. Um, even with that said, there may be some applications that don't receive funding, either because we're oversubscribed uh, or it just doesn't quite fit in with the guidelines that we've provided here earlier on the earlier slides. So just to kind of let you be aware that it's just not an automatic that you have funding just because an application is turned in. Uh, as I touched on, it could be due to lack of funding for projects or they just don't meet the guidelines. Um, we will Hi. retain, yeah. Sorry to interrupt real quick. Uh, is there a limit to how many uh, applications a particular agency or organization may? There is uh, not. Submit? Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right, thanks, Gina. So uh, we're gonna retain those applications as they come in. Uh, and if uh, additional funding sources come in, which we anticipate later this year, uh, we can actually make a determination on whether or not we can use those funding sources towards it. Or if it doesn't quite meet guidelines, uh, we can see if there's something we can work with from there. It's going to depend a little bit on the merits of the application and whether it fits in with the community and our own air district goals as well. Um, and then uh, if for some reason you don't want us to be holding on or on that, onto that application from a pending standpoint, uh, please just contact us and let us know. And, uh, and then we would just uh, take it out of the process there. And now we're moving into our project selection and funding criteria. Um, as we said, the application period is now open. And then really through the June and Aug through August period, we're gonna be doing reviewing those applications. Uh, and then we'll begin the, uh, the inspection process. Um, most likely inspections will be virtual inspections. Still at this point, there may be a, a handful of things that require an actual on-site inspection. But with the COVID restrictions, we're still pretty much doing virtual inspections. So uh, be prepared from that end that uh, you may need to assist us a little bit on those uh, on that element. Uh, the September through November timeframe uh, is when we're going to be going through approvals and contracting. And that is going to be, again, contingent on the number of applications we have and staffing availability. Uh, you know, we're going to work as quickly as we can in order to try and get these things, these projects contracted so you can get moving there. So from a planning standpoint, uh, we're probably looking at projects being delivered and invoiced in 2022. So as you can tell that even though we're in April, we're already talking about you know, projects probably not really arriving until probably say towards the end of this year. And uh, you, know, you can plan from that standpoint. We're gonna work with you. Obviously the COVID situation is still around at this point. Uh, you know, we've been in this remote work setting now for about a year. Uh, we may be able to get more back in the office here later this year, depending upon what happens. But right now, uh, you know, there are some challenges with everything going on. So we just wanna let you be aware of that. And then uh, one of the other key things is that, you know, we work as a reimbursement program. So this last statement says applicants will need to pay 100% of the project cost upon delivery and be reimbursed. Um, this is where the applicants can work with their dealerships. Uh, and that's, you know, whether the applicant has the money or whether they work with the dealership and do a short-term loan, we really won't get involved in that part of the process, but we just need you to be at least be aware of the fact that, you know, we will pay the project upon reimbursement. We will, we will reimburse the project upon a successful post completion or post inspection and the salvage inspection that, or I should say the old vehicle has been taken in uh, to our dealership for uh, uh, barn and auction yard which uh, will actually scrap the vehicle. So once the applicant has done all their steps, received the vehicle, successful post inspection, old vehicle turned in as, uh, as applicable into the uh, scrap place, then we will issue a check and the checks do come pretty quickly after that. So just kind of be aware of the payment structure that goes on there. Okay, and then as we've kind of talked about, and it's also been in the uh, solicitation material that's on our website, uh, this is going to be a competitive solicitation. So we are uh, on a two month period here of where the applications are coming in. And applications uh, in general have a chance to score five points. Uh, so you can get anywhere from zero to five points on your application. Uh, and each one of these bullets here qualifies as a point. So if you look on our maps on our website, and we don't have it right here on this because I think it starts getting a little bit convoluted with all the different criteria here. but. Uh, first off, if you're in an AB 617, what we call our Florence, South Sacramento, Sacramento community area, uh, this is one of the 10 priority zones in the state of California. 
if your project is located in that area that qualifies as a point. Um, you can get another point if your project is based in a disadvantaged community. You might wonder what's the difference between the first bullet and the second point. Well, even in the AB 617 area, some of that does not actually have a DAC zone in it. So the AB 617 zone has some DAC zones and other spots that are not. So hence, there is a distinction there. There are also a number of other areas within Sacramento and also Yolo Solano County, which is the other area that's gonna fit this category um, that has disadvantaged communities. And so you get a point for being able to make that criteria. The third bullet actually ties into our Moyer program. And uh, this is if it's in an AB 1390 a designated community. Um, we've been working off uh, that mapping criteria for a number of years now. And it's really tied more to an environmental justice criteria as well. So there's a point available for that. Um, and I would say for those first three bullets, that's where our staff uh, will definitely, we actually have the mapping tools uh, available. Um, at our disposal. And I think they will also be available on our website as well. Uh, but we can help clarify what which applications get points for those three first three points there. Uh, the projects with community support or interagency partnership, those are projects that are going to either need a letter of support from the community um, or there is some organization, community organization that is supporting that project. We're also going to be looking at having community leaders uh, evaluate our applications. And so there may be a, a potential for a point from that angle there, but there is one point that's gonna be given to projects uh, that basically have garnered this community support piece. And then uh, the last part here is complete applications ready to be funded and delivered. Um, I've touched on this on a couple of different spots where having complete applications uh, and projects that are ready to be funded do get ranked higher. Uh, if you got a project that's going to take five years to build versus one that's six months, uh, obviously the one that's going to be done in six months is going to be uh, one that has a better chance of being successfully funded. It's also in essence a first come first serve process. So applications that have been received in the first couple of weeks as compared to, but let's put it this way. If you have an application that met the first four points here and it's turned in on May 15th and you have another application that meets all the first four points and was turned on April 1st. Well, the one that was turned in on April 1st will get the point that's higher and will be ranked higher based off of that. So, so that's kind of how it'll work from, from that standpoint there. Mike? Yes. What if you turn in that same application on May 15th, it's four points, and someone turns in an application that scores five points on May 28th? Can you tell us what that looks like? Yeah, they would not, well, you're actually not gonna get five points for that because then that would be a different application. It would not be ahead of the May 15th application because the first come first serve. Got it, thank you very much. So, okay. All right, so, and then uh, of course, uh, projects are really gonna be reviewed, I'm gonna say actually by management and staff and the community for final decisions there and may need additional information uh, depending upon that information flow there. So in the event, this kind of goes back to Gina's question here. Let's say we have an application, you get two that have three points or two applications that are four points, or let's say you have two applications that are five points. Um, then we're gonna come into maybe some other criteria here where we'll be looking at cost effectiveness of the project. Uh, we do have emission reduction tools to kind of help determine that cost effectiveness. Uh, and then also the use of zero emission technology. We do have a preference at this point um, to go zero mission where feasible. Um, we also realize that there are project areas, for example, most of your off-road equipment does not have uh, zero mission equipment available. Um, and then on-road projects, there are zero mission equipment available. So use of zero mission technology is gonna be a preference. Um, we will look at community input uh, that may actually affect some of the ranking as well from that uh, situation there. And of course, um, you know, we're gonna, uh, encourage also as well that you still turn in your application even if you don't have quote all five points there. So we may have some applications that only meet one point and that would be perhaps the first come first serve. But if the other applications behind it only get one point, uh, don't even meet the other community elements, but uh, you know, we're behind on the uh, first come first serve piece, you know, we can work with it from there. So 
please turn in your applications. That's ultimately what we're saying here. Uh, we really don't know how things are going to finish up on the ranking process until we actually receive all applications. That's actually hence a solicitation and running an RFP is that you bring them all together and then you rank them uh, accordingly from that information there. Uh, let's see, next slide. Okay, and then I think from a timing standpoint, uh, as we talked about, uh, your projects, we're looking at really the 2021 and 2022 timeframes here. That's partly because the funding streams we're looking at do have uh, timeframes that you have to look at here. If you got projects that are going beyond that point, still please feel please feel free to go ahead and submit those applications into us. Just be aware that they may not have as high a priority as ones that are going to be coming in here over the next year and a half. Uh, but we do realize that some of these infrastructure projects uh, potentially can go longer, and uh, we are willing to work with you on that. Uh, and then I think the other element that comes into play here, if for some reason it's going to take a while, uh, we will work with you to see if we have funding available or perhaps some other district funding sources uh, that may be uh, able to be applied here in order to make that project a success. Um, you know, obviously we always wanna plan ahead for complications. Uh, we know that there's always gonna be things that you need to do. So make sure you're well-organized and have your I's dotted and T's crossed and uh, just make sure we can uh, plan for the fact that there may be contingencies there. Uh, and then the advanced technology equipment, um, you know, as it says here, it requires new fueling and maintenance requirements to so plan for those as well. Um, you know, it's not just buying a zero emission truck or a, or for example, let's say even hydrogen vehicles come around. Uh, we need to at least make sure, you'll need to at least make sure that you plan for how you actually operate that equipment uh, along the way. And, uh, you know, for example, for EV, electric vehicle infrastructure, we need to kind of plan for, for that as well. Um, as I mentioned before, obviously, if you contact us with email, that's probably going to be the fastest response, uh, but we do have uh, information available for you uh, on our website here. Okay, so I think that wraps up that part of the presentation here. Um, I'm sure it looks like there's been questions floating along in the chat room. I think I'm going to go ahead and open this up now. Uh, Christian, I think you're going to We'll have both of us here, at least online. Gina, I know you're here, and I think we have some other staff members as well. So uh, let's open this up for a Q&A session, and uh, we'll just kind of we'll do the best we can to answer your questions here. If for some reason we are unable to answer it, we will work on getting back to you, and uh, we'll go from there. What is the email that uh, is the best email for people to send us questions, direct questions? Um, the best is to go to each funding source page by Carl Moyer, Farmer, and we have links on each of those pages to the staff who do that. Um, like I said, Pat Robinson helps out with Farmer. Uh, Heather Taylor is our school bus guru. Um, you know, if you got CCAT questions, you can talk to any of us. Uh, just go there. That's the best way. 50 Corridor is raising their hand. <clears throat> Hi, this is Leah, the executive director of the 50 Corridor TMA. So I'm just taking a look at this application. Um, and if we're just applying and we're not, we're not sure which pot of funding we're going for, um, I see a lot of, you know, you can, you can put in the information about the vehicles, but where, like what kind of narrative do you guys need about the project as a whole, where it is, who it's serving, what it <laughs> Um, is there a template that we use to write that out? I assume that we attach it in the attachments area. Yeah, there we have the ability on the online application to attach documents to it. Um, so if, if there's anything that's listed on the checklists uh, as a required uh, materials for your application and it's not in the online application itself, then you would have to scan it and attach it to the application. Got it. Thank you. Um, Christian, we have a question in the chat that I'm not sure how to answer. Is there a list somewhere of past recipients or is this a new program? I know the second part. I don't know the first part. Um, this question's come up a lot. Uh, we don't post a list of past recipients. Um, that's that's kind of a somewhat sensitive information. So you do have to submit a public records request to get that information. 
And I'll, I'll also add in here as well. Um, on our website, you will see, for example, the community air protection program because that's under a little more uh, of a public eye per se for those funds. We do have some projects listed there for, uh, for the year one and year two that we have listed there, but Christian is correct. Historically, we have not listed projects on the uh, website that is more of a public information request. Um, and, and there are some reasons behind that. I mean, for the businesses that are actually participating in it, um, you know, if you think about it from that perspective, if their name is up there, then there, there's the potential that they could be contacted by a lot of different dealerships, a lot of other parties. Uh, you know, they may be getting some unwanted solicitation to be doing different things along the way. And there can also be some personal information on the applicants as well. So that particular area, you know, while there's no harm in saying, hey, this school participated or this government agency participated, there are a lot of other businesses that may wish to be a little bit quiet quieter under the radar. So we're trying to be make sure we're sensitive to the community and make sure we address uh, the needs in terms of projects that are occurring within their area. And uh, so we, from a, an official process, we do have a public information request, which allows us to review that app, the request there, and then provide the appropriate information from there. We're, we're trying to be as transparent as we can, but we also want to respect uh, the businesses as well that are participating in our programs. And, um, you know, so there's a partnership there from that standpoint. Just for clarification, when do we expect uh, contracts to be awarded? Projects to be awarded? We, uh, as we covered on the slides, it's, we're probably looking at the August, September, October timeframe. It might even be November, December, depending upon where we're at. But we're probably looking at, you know, the short answer is probably fall of this year in terms of when most the most contracts would be going out. Looks like we got a question in the chat about the vehicles. Yeah, if when you submit a online application, it will ask you if you're submitting a one for one or multiple vehicle application. As soon as you select multiple vehicle application, there's a, a, a window that or a, an area that pops up where you can download the spreadsheet where you can type in all the multiple vehicle information and attach that. So you only need to submit one application. Would the presentation be available? Oh, was the question, is it available? Yeah, we, uh, we will have this. Uh, we're going to have a, the presentation available and also uh, the recording of this will be available on our website as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this. This was really helpful. And, and thanks, Mike, for um, your interest in the lawn and garden segment of this. I really appreciate that and, and thinking about moving forward. Um, I'm part of a, a collaboration of folks called Mow Better. We actually have folks from the air quality management district involved in what we're doing. And so, um, so this is super helpful. And I'm just wondering, is there gonna, is there a chance for citizens to be involved in this uh, reiteration of the Carl Moyer guidelines that you mentioned, um, something that we could do from our group side to help expand those guidelines to include other types of, of hazardous uh, lawn and garden equipment that we need to replace with clean tools? Yeah, I th actually, there there are a number of ways of going about that. Um, first off, I'll, I'll kind of explain a little bit, just a little bit about how the air districts and ARB interact a little bit here, because I think that'll help explain the context of this. Uh, the air pollution, air pollution and control districts actually have an association called the California Air Pollution Control Officers Association, um, and that's basically a represent. It's a, it's basically our lobbying group or our lobbying. It's supported by the air districts, but basically it's it's the air district representation for the all the air districts through the state of California. Um, and obviously, as you might guess, that group is not only do we have small, medium and large size air districts in there, but obviously you've got quite a few different policy views that come in there. But we, uh, the air district office, pollution control officers do work together and we work together even on our incentive programs uh, in subcommittees to kind of help develop policy from the air district per perspective from a statewide basis. Uh, and then we work closely with Air Resources Board, obviously, on all these programs. As you might guess, it's a, you know, there are, there are a parent agency in essence. So yes, we work closely with them. In fact, I almost, when we were working on site, we almost wish we just had an on-site badge. We could just go over to the EPA building so we could just sign in, you know, and just walk <laughs> in just like a regular employee because you had meetings there all the time. Right. Uh, that aside, that said, um, as I mentioned here, the Moyer chapter itself that we're working on, we're kind of working on more on a quiet basis here. Uh, where we're trying to get some chapter four, the on-road park 
updated because we're getting to a point where the chapter is almost obsolete in terms of even being able to fund trucks. And so that from a community perspective and just a state perspective, that was clearly the highest part of it there from that end.